thing. So today what we are going to see is um, I have been showing a little bit, I will be taking a little bit theory on what is differential expression because this, this uh, sorry, differential expression is the main theme around which this whole RNA-seq analysis is actually um, constructed. So our idea would like, uh, we'll just go through uh, the main idea of why, I mean, uh, the statistical uh, analysis that is behind uh, differential expression. Uh, with respect to that, we'll be learning about only one uh, particular um, uh, tool uh, or a package called this uh, differential, like uh, differential um, uh, DE seq. It's called. So uh, the authors are like uh, the authors of this part uh, package are called as Michael Love and uh, uh, Wolfgang Huber. They're like very big names in the um, RNA seq analysis as it as such. So before going through that, I, I also want to go through very basics of these count transformations per se, and why we do these count transformations when we use RNA-seq. So, um, so for example, if you want to, uh, so before going to a differential expression analysis, so differential expression analysis is nothing but where and when you learn about the different genes that are actually displaying uh, if, for example, a, a particular gene is upregulated or downregulated between two groups. Uh, for example, you treat a particular sample with two different conditions. Uh, for example, you have a control sample and you take few of these uh, cells and you uh, put them in a particular condition. You try to change them and you want to see exactly what genes are upregulated or what genes are exactly downregulated. So you would want to see uh, how this particular, uh, you know, um, um, uh, what kind of changes are there in the genes and everything. So that analysis is called as differential ex ex expression. So before we go to uh, differential expression, so there are several things that you would want to know. For example, like I, I actually went through all these basics last week, but I'm just repeating them. So there are two things, main things. The, uh, these are called as replicates. There are two kinds of replicates, uh, one being a biological replicate, replicate and other being a technical replicate. So the technical replicates are samples where you have prepped the library and then if, and you have prepped the library and you, uh, so these replicates are when you resequence the same library. Whereas biological replicates are when the sequence samples are actually represent the biological condition. For example, you're doing a differential analysis between tumor versus normal. And then for example, you correct tumor from different people. So the tumor samples from different people are called as biological replicates. Uh, for example, you take a person A and then you prep a library and then you sequence it. And the same library is resequenced using another platform. So uh, the thing about uh, RNA-seq is that it is all the counts are all very platform specific. There might be a batch effect because of platform. There might be a batch effect because of you know, the library, how it was prepared, there are a lot of batch effects. So, uh, so uh, for example, if a, uh, if a team wants to exclude all those kinds of batch, batch, batch effects, what would they would do is to, uh, you know, sequence it from different sources and everything. So those are called as technical replicates. So in case of differential analysis, we would want to use biological replicates. So you would want several replicates from the same condition that you're trying to contrast. For example, you're trying to contrast tumor versus normal, and then you would want at least three or more replicates between these two, uh, for each of these tumor, for each of the normals. So at least you would want six samples with three representing each of the condition. So, um, so when you look at these data, for example, when you just, for example, look at the data, yeah. So uh, I have just taken this plot from one of the work, workbooks. So you just look at two samples, okay? You have a sample SRR uh, 508 and then 509. So when you look at these samples and look at the spread of the gene counts, this is nothing but the count of the gene, I mean, the count of the genes. So when you look at this, we can see that with very less, uh, you know, there's a very, very high, um, variance or there is very very high variance when the counts are less 
whereas in case of very high cons you can we don't see a lot of variability between these two samples so in order to reduce this variability we can use several algorithms which i don't want to i don't want to go into the uh, you know a lot of uh, theoretical uh, stuff so i just want to introduce you to these uh, transforms so there are uh, so what we can do one is to use a log transform but i'll actually on the hands on tutorial I'd, i'll actually show that these log transforms do not work but there's something called as a variance stabilization uh, transform so which is what is being used in the right side and when you look at it even at the low count there is not much of a variability so this will help us to also use this very low read low gene counts because for example not only the up, very high counting reads must give us any information between the difference between two different groups but even a low for example if you take an uh, if you take a scenario where few genes are very highly expressed in a uh, tumor sample and very very lowly expressed in a uh, normal sample this is just a scenario so we would want these lowly expressed genes to also give us information right so when you just simply use the counts directly you would not because of a uh, very high variance or very high uh, variability so you would not find you would not be able to use these counts but as but using a, uh, such a variance transform algorithm will help us to use these counts as well in any exploratory data analysis and such so i'm just going to uh, start with uh, r studio right now so i'll just start with um, very few basics so for example um, okay uh, Okay, control L is uh, cleared everything. Okay. So, um, hello, Akshay. Yes, sir. We don't see the R Studio if you open the R Studio. Okay, one second. I'll just share my screen. Okay, is it yeah, okay? It's fine. Yeah. So, um, okay, I'll just go to the basics. so in before you start with any differential analysis i mean any any uh, new analysis i like to go to the directory wherever you put all your files because uh, this uh, command call is set work directory gives us uh, so you if you specify the path it will go to that particular directory and then uh, we would want to use few tools i mean few packages in r so the one that we are going to use today the one we are going to actually learn to use today is called as dc2 so um so i'm loading this particular package by using this particular command after loading the package and i'm also using few of the options a uh, few of the other packages called as deep player and tidy us because they use for ma uh, data frame manipulation and everything and i have become very comfortable using that so i am going to be lo loading both of these so um and let's for example if you want to look at files in case of r in the particular directory you can give list of files or you can give list of files and then specify the path in the command i mean in between the comma uh, between the open quotes over here so right now uh, since i'm already in the library we can see that i have saved the count table dot text and the uh, and i would also want a metadata to say what conditions these are prepped in so to use dec we would want two files basically the first file is a count file where you have the uh, okay let me load it first okay i'm loading the read file using this particular function called as read dot table so once i read the file i can view this particular uh, table using the view command so i would want the table to be in this particular format where the samples are in the columns so you have the samples in the columns and you have the gene names in actually the rows so these gene names can be any format like for example you can give here they have used 
So here in this particular count table, there is gene names, but you can use transcripts or your own gene symbols, or you can um, the gene symbols can be used. So whatever uh, you know, um, rows can be any kind of information. But, uh, it does not exactly necessarily have to be genes, but it can also be transcripts or anything. So um, so this is the format of the count table that has to be given into DSEQ. And then next, what we would want is a phenotype data. So the phenotype data, I have saved it. And I'm calling the table as metadata. So I am again loading this table by using the readout table command. So after loading the table, I'm again going to, so you can visualize the table by using view metadata or you can go here and click it. So um, when you have a lot of tables, this command view helps you actually. So when we have come, like, uh, when you look at the metadata, what we would want here is we would want columns of information. For example, if we want to study regarding time or if you want to study regarding two protocols, for example, here uh, in the whole DEC analysis, my plan here is to study the differential expression between the control and uh, a treated uh, and the treated condition. So let's just take there are two conditions and we, we want to uh, see the differential expression between these two treated conditions. So here again, the like we saw before, the samples are supposed to be in the columns in case of the count table. Whereas in case of the metadata, you want the uh, samples to be in the rows and the variables or the conditions that you want to use in the differential analysis, you want that to be in the columns, okay? And these have to, like the name, and also the main important thing is the names of the columns, I mean, the names of the rows and the names and the name in the count column have to be the same. They have to match. Only then DEC will run and create an object. So, yeah. So there are several ways to create this DSEC object. So the idea is to create a DSEC object and then do the analysis. So the DSEC object takes the data set in, in terms of a matrix and it also takes in several other uh, forms, for example, DSEC. So yeah, like I said, the so DSEC data set from HTC count. So HTC count is actually a counting, um, for example, you have aligned your reads to the reference genome and you want to count the reads and everything. So HTSeq is actually a counting algorithm. So you can use HTSeq and it stores in a particular format. You can directly use it format. Or you can also use TXI import, TX import. TX import is again a type of, um, you know, accounting uh, algorithm or accounting package. I, that again uh, after align it uh, you would use an external tool to align and then it would count the reads actually one second yeah so these are the different functions through which you can actually uh, create a DSEC object so the first part would be to create a DSEC object so in the DSEC object, we would give the count data. For the count data, we give the count matrix. And then for the column data, we give the column matrix. So we here, since we have gotten our sample from an external source, so I'm just using it as a, uh, using, like I'm, I'm, I'm manipulating in the form of a matrix. So I'm just using this DSEC data from matrix uh, function. Here, the main thing over here is something called as design. So in DTS, the design can be in different combinations. So to get a design, right now it is in tilde one. The so design ha always has to be in this particular format. The design equal to there's a tilde sign, and then you give whatever you design want, you want it to be. So for example, if you give a design of one means you're not giving any information regarding the metadata. So you're not giving the DSEC object or DSEC any idea about how your 
account data is actually structured. So all the analysis that we do is actually blind analysis. So for example, if you're looking at, um, so like we saw before, like uh, I told you about the need of transformation of data. So right now, let's just look at how this transformation can actually occur. Um, yeah, so before going to that, so there's something called this, um, like I said, variance tra uh, stabilization transform. So this VST is the one that we are going to use to, um, you know, transform our counts. So I've actually run this before because it takes a little bit time to run. And VST is, uh, so there are two transformations that I told to, talk to you about, which is, uh, which is also implemented by the DEC package. So there are two, uh, the, the first one is the variance stabilization transform and there's a R log transform. It is a regularized logarithm. So then just, you know, simply taking the logarithm of a count and then adding a base value or adding any shifting value. So you actually, you parameter, parameterize the logarithm using a, another external value. So all of that will help you to control the variance at very, very low mean counts. So there's not a lot of um, huge variance between these uh, samples. So all of this analysis initially, for example, to get to the design, we would actually want to see the major variances that is present in the source, that is present in our data, for example. For example, in our data, when you look at the uh, metadata, so you have several technical replicates. So these are these two are technical replicates, which means that these two are from the same source, but they have been, uh, you know, uh, sequenced, like they're from the same source from the same library, but they're sequenced for more than one time. So these, uh, so these are from the same source. So, and also when you look at the protocol, these two are, so for example, there are different protocols, right? There are four samples in which has got the normal protocol. I mean, these are, which are taken as control. And then there are four samples which have been treated in a, in a, in a particular way. Um, I uh, don't know what, how they've been treated, but they've been taken in a particular, we don't have to go into all those uh, itty, -bitty, itty bitty details for now. And there's also one another variation. When you look at these replicates, right? When you look at these, uh, when they have, when there's another variation in the data as well, which is the time variation. So when you look at the time, we can see that there are so many, uh, I mean, there have been, there are two um, time points of, at which they have been uh, sequenced actually. So this time period could also be a source of variation because when, um, uh, so when you're treating a cell or treating anything with, a particular condition or a particular uh, in a particular way for a very long time that it's a, that could also give us certain differences right it could also lead to certain uh, differences so this time is something we should see if it is actually causing a lot of variation so to see these variation we can use a, a exploratory data analysis kind of uh, technique to see these variation so what you do is um, there are several ways to look at these variations. For example, we can plot a PCA or we could do a hierarchical clustering analysis or you could do, um, so there are things called as multi, um, multi-dimensional scale analysis or you could do a TSNE plot or a lot of visualization techniques are there to look at major sources of variance, variation uh, between these um, sources. So here, what we are going to do here, we are going to do is a very simple PCA plot. And we try to see, initially we transform the, uh, all the data, all the raw counts into a variance transform count. And then we try to plot the PCA. So for example, okay, I'll just show you how the DDS uh, object looks like. So, so this, when you just specify the DDA, it says that it is from the DEC data class, and then it has got 29,516 rows and then eight columns, which means there are eight samples and there are so many genes that is present in that. And then you have several, um, the call data information and then the row data information and everything. 
And if, for example, if you want to look at the design that is being used, you just put DDS at design and then you get the design. And for example, um, so yeah, so I'll get to all that analysis. So for, uh, for right now here, uh, it should be DDS. DDS is equal to one, which means we are not giving any information. So there is no information at all. You're not giving them any information regarding which sample belongs to which control or uh, sorry, which protocol or which sample belongs to which time group. No information is given. And then we uh, and we also specify this. So it, it, even though if you give any design and then you can actually specify it by running blind. So for example, uh, you already give a design. For example, you uh, you want to account for the data difference as well as the time difference in the design. But then you want to do the VST analysis blind of these uh, design idea. So then you give blind is equal to true. And if, but if you also want to incorporate the design into the VST. So what happens is that how this differs is that the when the variance is stabilized, um, so the variance stabilization is actually occurring across all the samples if you give the blind to be true. But if you give blind to be false, the individual groups are actually accounted and those groups are uh, only used for, uh, the, I mean, there's variance stabilization within the groups. So that's how these um, this blind is equal to true and the blind is equal to false, false work. Uh, so after calculating the VST data, we're just going to plot the PCA right now. So, okay. So uh, this plot PCA is actually a function in DEC. So this particular PCA is actually very good because we see a very, very high difference across the groups given the percentage is very, very high. The PC1 is around 93% and the PC2 is around 3%. That accounts for around 94% of variance that is present in the data. And the highest variance is actually captured by the groups between, between the two protocols, actually. So the control and the whatever treated one captures the biggest variance. So this so if you if you just going to look at uh, differential analysis and you want to give this as a design we already it's kind of validating that you know you see a lot of differences between uh, for, between these groups already so it's it's you know the kind of so when you go downstream and look at a pathway you find for example you find the differentially expressed genes between two, these two groups and then you do set of pathway analysis and finally you reach pathways so you will actually see very good clear pathways that is actually uh, changed or downregulated or upregulated because of these particular treatments. So this PCA part is very good in regard to that. So, but there can be other uh, kinds of variation. There could be other variables that are actually causing the variation. And right now, uh, it could also be time because the uh, duration for which you treat sample could also cause a variation. So, if we look at the time variation per se, uh, yeah. See, again, in case of the, I think the right side ones were actually the control. So in the uh, control group, actually we could see the, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the, they're very distinct clusters between the, uh, between the controls. Whereas in case of the treated, they're not, they kind of camouflaged and they're not exactly distinct. So, we could again use this since this uh, these um, the duration is also giving us some information. We are going to use this information as well in the design uh, kind of the design that we are going to use. One second. Okay. Um, before going to that, I'll actually I actually want to go through um, another example. Uh, yeah, so this is what uh, we're going to go through. 
Okay, so um, so there are, like I said, there are different statistical packages that are actually that could be used in case of uh, differential analysis, such as DSEQ. There are there is when uh, there is also very uh, important and uh, another very widely used tool that is called as EDGAR. So uh, the main thing about DSEQ and EDGAR is that uh, these actually model the raw counts or the counts uh, as an negative binomial count in the uh, by using a negative binomial assumption uh, like the counts are following a negative binomial uh, distribution and everything whereas in case of dg seek and lumar they actually uh, assume a poisson distribution of these raw counts um, actually the how it actually evolved was that initially people started modeling it as poisson counts and then they later used a negative binomial count and negative binomial count seem to be doing very good when you have very low number of replicates. But if you have very good replicates, for example, you know each of the condition is called around 15 to 20 replicates, you have you might as well go and model it as a Poisson distribution because, and you might as well use a very basic uh, Wilcoxon rank sum test or something like that to find the differential genes. But we are going through all these painstaking methods because our, we, you know, most of the time in a laboratory or when you're working with something, most of the time, the number of replicates are not going to be very high because, because of cost issue. And then it's, it's not very easy to have many technical replicates or biological replicates because RNA seek again, even though there's not a lot of sequencing, uh, compared to a whole genome sequencing or whole exome sequencing, but still it is uh, up to a level, it is a lot. So um, so the number of replicates and everything is going to be not so great. It's going to be three to five or in that range. So, but if you have very good or very, very high number of replicates, it's better to go with a Poisson kind of modeling assumption. Uh, that is something I wanted to put forth. And then, here again, this is an example where we can learn how to use the design formulas. So in this particular table that I have put over here, there are eight samples and then there is variation in case of sex. Like there are four females and four males and there is also variation in case of ages. And then, um, so when you look at the litter, there are only two conditions where uh, there are only two um, you know, two states, for example, one, one, uh, there's one and two. But um, the thing is, when you use litter in the design, uh, that uh, if you use it, uh, litter in the design, you might find, you might, it might lead to something called as the matrix not full. So when the matrix is not full, which means that you would need at least few samples in both the conditions so that the matrix is full. So we cannot be using this particular litter information in the matrix right now. But the thing is, when you design, when you use a design formula, our ultimate idea is that you're using the design formula to study the two conditions in a variable. For example, like before we study the two conditions uh, that is present in the protocol, uh, here you want to study two different conditions that is present in control and treatment. But there might be other variations, like I said, and these variations have to be accounted for and has to be used in the design formula. So that variation, for you to be sure that these this actually could be a major driving factor or this could actually cause some variation, is to do a exploratory data analysis. And it can be, like I said before, it can be done in very different, like in a lot of different ways. And... Uh, only with after doing a thorough exploratory data analysis, you should be able to come to the conclusion that, okay, these are the particular um, variables or these are the particular, uh, uh, you know, uh, metadata information that you would want to use in the design and then proceed on with that. So when you're constructing this design, you have, uh, there are several variables, like for example, sex, age, and treatment. So the, that um, you can actually either use this treatment as the final variable or you can specify it in any order. Uh, for example, if you want to contrast between uh, control versus treatment in, in the uh, like under treatment. So you, uh, if you want the program to be automatically taking that, you would want to put the treatment in the final, 
say this particular thing has to be put in the final uh, design in the formula whereas if you want to uh, you know like uh, you can either you can put it in any way and then you have to specify when you're contrasting you would want to specify the particular treatment and the way you want it to count it you want it to be contrasted so uh, that is one thing okay um, yeah so what happens is that after that in the dec analysis you would want to um, put these put the uh, for example like when you go into the metadata you would want to factor them the factor is that it helps you find the different levels that is present in this particular column so when i run factor of metadata dot protocol you can see two levels being there so one being the control and the other being uh, alpha snl for example you want to contrast in the other way um, for example you want to contrast l5 snl with respect to the control so then you would have to specify it exactly and i'll let i'll tell you how to do that in the uh, proceeding uh, i'll just let you know i'll tell you how to do that but um, yeah so the idea is to factor it uh, using you know since we are going to use these two columns we are going to use the time column as well as the protocol column in the analysis we are going to be using these two um, columns you have to run them so when you look at the factors that is present in time there are two factors one being the month factor other being the row factor so right now after so yeah so we've come to a point where we want to do a differential expression analysis and then you put that in design in the design right now i have put time plus protocol and i have put in i put protocol at the last because i want to contrast between the protocols so uh, i am running this command where i have uh, created a design where i have put time information as well because it might cause some uh, it it has got some variability in the design so which is why i am incorporating it in the design formula and after that you run this dseq command function so this dseq function is the one that you know does a lot of steps in between so it does several steps in between which i'll be explaining right now because this is what we want to so um, like i said before when you look at when you do an analysis or when you uh, you know when you go through a study you have very limited number of samples for example the study itself might be big but the conditions that you want to contrast and learn when you look at the specific conditions the number of replicates might be very very small so this is where dgsic actually helps us in a huge way so there are several steps right so that i'll be just going through these several steps uh one second yeah so what it does in this first step is that it estimates the size factors like i think we've actually gone through what a size factor normalization is in the last time last um, uh, you know a tutorial so size factor is nothing but where you um, normalize with respect to the library size but it actually has got several steps uh, what it does is for every single zine it takes a geometric mean across all the counts and then divides it with this particular geometric mean and then when you go along the column wise it takes a median of all these uh, you know ratios and then takes a median as the size factor and this size factor is again uh, used to uh, divide it divide across all the um, counts so we have a particular size factor for every single sample you will have a size factor that is actually in a way um you know in a way where it is not dependent upon extreme values uh, which is why we are using the median of all the ratios so um so it the first step it does is it, it takes something it uh, calculates something called as size factors after calculating size factor what it does is uh, like we we learned before that you know there might be for a particular for a particular sample or for example a lot of samples when you're trying to model it you you want to model it with respect to a uh, you know um, a particular distribution or anything when you want to model it 
you would also want to know the variability within the particular group for example we are modeling with respect we are modeling two conditions where there is tumor versus normal you would want to know the for a particular gene you would want to know the variability of the counts within the samples that are present in tumors and the variability of the genes that is um, you know for a particular gene that is present in the normal so to find this variability you would generally to get a very good estimate of the variability you would actually need a lot of samples but here what happens is that when you have two or like not two when you go with three or um, four or five samples the variability here comes into question so you don't have a very good estimate so what dec does is that it calculates something called this dispersion so this is how it calculates where variance is equal to the mu uh, i mean mu is the mean of the counts plus alpha here is the dispersion value into square of the uh, mean so basically this dispersion value is directly in proportion with the variance and inversely in proportion with the mu so there are several ways to calculate this this variation right like the central tendency of de uh, deviation so you ca you can you, we use variance we use um, standard deviation there's interquartile range so there are so many statistics statistic to use to calculate the the dispersion in to characterize the dispersion in the counts so what dc does is it leverages an idea called this dispersion with the with this particular uh, you know with the, with this particular relationship it it tries to calculate uh, something called as a dispersion so what it does is for every so it goes on with the assumption that if a particular if the if the genes are having a particular mean then then their dispersion might be the might be you know in the same range so this is the overall idea with which it proceeds with so what it does is for every single mean count or a particular gene it calculates a dispersion value with a maximum likelihood it takes a maximum likelihood score and then it uh, calculates a possible alpha for this dispersion and then what it does is it uses all the information from all the genes and then it fits a curve and then it kind of shrinks whatever dispersion values are very very away from the curve are actually shrunk towards the curve so and then after that after calculating after you know accounting and you know correcting for the variance across all the genes for every single gene what it does is it assumes a um a negative binomial uh, kind of distribution and then it characterizes and it uh, calculates something called this uh, log full change value for every single gene between two conditions and then uh, using this uh, nb um, i mean negatively binomial distribution assumption it also calculates a p value and then it uh, it also calculates by using all the information from every gene it corrects for it and uh, using a um, uh, benjamini hodgepok uh, adjusted i mean correction it adjusts the p value and then it calculates a adjusted p value and then um, which will be uh, which i'll actually will actually do the analysis and uh, review in the table so yeah so what happens is that when there is very high so this is actually a um, you know um, a plot where you're looking at the mean of different genes and also the variance that is present in different gene counts so when you look at means of you know genes that are very highly expressed so these genes have even they are like they have the same mean counts but the variance are also kind of you know they like there is not a big spread in the variance so what happens is that these like for example when you have a mean gene count this variation is something you can actually easily predict when you even if you fit a even if you fit any uh, straight line these variants will be like easy to predict whereas when the means of the variants are very very less there is a very very high difference in the variance of these gene counts so these genes are very very tough to predict i mean you cannot even if you fit a curve it's very tough to predict so this is why we have the dispersion idea like a dc package uses a dispersion idea and then uh, so here the 
you know, for example, the, for every single uh, mean of the normalized count, like I said, in the first step, they do size factor normalization. And then for every single um, uh, gene, they calculate the mean, and then, then they calculate the dispersion for, uh, given a maximum likelihood, uh, what could be the dispersion for, I mean, this particular uh, mean of normalized counts. So after calculating these dispersions, then what it does is it fits the, um, <clears throat> okay, the, uh, it finds a fit for this uh, whole, uh, all the data points. And then the final one is uh, when you actually learn, read, I mean, the thing is that there are, uh, so the red curve is the final fitted curve. And then the, uh, you know, the blue dots are the genes for which the dispersion has been adjusted over here. And then you, when you look at these black dots over which the blue uh, circle is drawn, these are actually outliers. So these genes are actually not even used in the DEC analysis. So like I said, this is how, like this is a very clear representation in the right side where you have the few outliers, which are very, very like, which does not even go near the curve. So these outliers are not used in the further analysis. Whereas when you look at um, very high, um, you know, for example, when you look at very high mean cons, it, all the, you know, the mean cons are kind of closer to the fitted curve. Whereas in case of, you know, when you look at very low mean cons, there are few um, genes where, which is actually very, very farther away because of very high variability that you see in low mean cons. So, all of this is accounted for in case of a D in case of DEC. So after accounting for all of this, it, so all of these steps are actually done in a single function. So you just put DEC of this particular object, you get the data of it. So um, before going to that, uh, before going to actually see how this uh, result is, uh, I also want to. Um, tell you about a few different things like in order to access the size factor normalized counts we can actually use this particular command i mean this particular function called this uh, size factor size factors of dts so you can actually look at the what are the numbers that has been used to call the what exactly is the size factor that has been used for normalization so it will actually give us exact size factor that was used for normalization. And if you want to normalize cones, not just the raw cones. Um, so if, even if you want the raw cones, you would have to, uh, if you want to see the raw cones in case of DDS, you would have to give um, counts of the, so I have saved in a matrix called as count. So you, the function that you give is counts. So, but if you give counts, it'll produce all the 29,000 or 26,000 genes into so many, such a big matrix. So I'm just giving head of that to give us uh, just an idea of how this um, table looks like. Sorry, uh, you would have to give counts of TDS because that is the object. Yeah, so this is how this is the count object that is present in the DDS. So um, you have all the columns and the different genes in the rows. So for example, if you want to look at the normalized counts, so we have to give counts of DDS and then uh, and you have to specify that you want it to be normalized. Uh, we can look at it. So the basic idea is that these, all the raw counts will be divided by this particular size factor that is given for each of the sample. For example, there is two. So if you take two divided by 0 0.5, uh, this particular number, let's just uh, take an example and try that. So 3.8779, right? So this is the same count that you get over here. So the idea is that for every single column, you have a size factor and you divide it with that size factor to get the normalized counts. So um, this is the data frame. So 
for example i'm just showing you how this relates like because last time we spoke about library normalization and everything right so and i just want you to see how this normalization has actually occurred with respect to size factor normalization so for example we're just looking at column sums so the column sums are actually very very different for different different all the samples right for example this is only around 4 million this is around 52 million sorry uh, sorry this is 5 million so this would be around 23 million these are all 5 million reads but this is around 23 million reads so if we just straight away use the uh, you know straight away try to do any kind of differential analysis this would actually cut a lot, a lot of problems because this particular sample has got very very high reads compared to the rest of the other samples so but then when you look at column sums we all we kind of have a you know uniform it's around like 10 to so 9 million reads so these counts are actually kind of you know something that you can compare with respect to different samples and everything so this is the main reason why we do normalization and then um, before we had uh, learned about the plot dispersion uh, right so there are few model fitting where you we would actually we would have to see the plot dispersion um, you know plots to actually uh, to say whether if this particular uh, you know this particular fitting has actually done been done well for example in our uh, Yeah, so this is actually a pretty good dispersion this is not a, like for example there might be a lot of so these are all outliers over here if you have a lot of i mean uh outliers like these or you know this is actually a very good plot because um you know the spread of the genes itself is not very very huge and also the uh, the way it has been fitted also it's kind of good for example if you see a lot of genes over in the bottom or if you see a lot of genes in the top uh, then you would actually uh, then there's a problem which means that you would have to look at other variations that are present in the data itself and you have to account for them in your design and then again you have to do the entire process again to find out the exact um, you know for example you have to put all this variation in the design only then you have a good plot i mean good uh, dispersion plot so that is one of the main things using the dispersion plot. Yeah, so now we are actually coming to the results. So for example, the thing is, we want to contrast between two different conditions, right? So here we're going to contrast in protocol. Um, one second. I'm just actually, so even if you give uh, directly, if you just give results of DTS, it will contrast with respect to protocol. So I'm just showing you how to specify it also. For example, if you want to give these two. Uh, for example, if I'm just giving, um, if I'm just giving results of DTS, just for the, just to see how it looks, okay? So what if, if I give results of just DTS, it's going to use protocol because our, uh, you know, the final variable in the design has been, has been protocol. But the thing is, in the way it contrasts will be control versus L5 which means if you have a gene that is upregulated which means that this particular gene has been upregulated and controlled and if you have a gene that has got a very it's got a negative log full change value mean would mean that 
that particular gene is upregulated in the uh, this particular uh, condition l5 snl but i would want to control this particular condition with respect to the control then what you do is you specify everything you specify with results you specify you want to use protocol and then you want to use l5 snl versus control yeah now we can look at the results now when you look at the results this log full change value is positive which means this particular gene has been upregulated in the uh, control i mean in the treated condition with respect to the control and um, so there are several um, you know uh, columns that is present over here which i'll be explaining so the thing is for every gene we have a base mean value so that this is the mean of the size factor normalized counts and then you have a log full change so this log full change is actually the uh, you know how so for example this particular gene is three times more expressed in the treated condition with respect to the control for example the log full change if it is minus for example i am taking the final 16 this means that this particular gene is 2.27 times less expressed or i mean 2. Point, it is um so you can also look at in this way so you can also say that it is not expressed or it is relatively very very less expressed in, in the treated condition with respect to the control or you can also think like okay it is more expressed in the control and relatively non expressed in case of uh, the treated condition so then what we have is a standard error log full change the standard error of the log full change value and then we have a statistic and then you have a p value and a adjusted p value so when you look at it you would want to look at so this for every gene there has been a general linear uh, sorry general linear model fitting and then uh, using the uh, distribution however they uh, you know if it is a poisson or a neg negative binomial they give a p value so but then this p value is actually done for every single gene and when you look at whole as a bunch of genes you would want to look at the p adjusted value so here where it is these p values are adjusted and corrected with respect to i think uh, here they have used a benjamini hochberg uh, adjustment on the p values so we would want to use a particular uh, we would only want to use p adjusted value so generally people will Uh, you know example for example take a p adjusted value of 5% or 1% uh, so in that case and similarly we here also would want to subset the entire thing entire you know um, uh, uh, entire list of genes into a particular value for, for example a particular p value and then look at the um, genes that are actually highly expressed i mean Uh, then you look at a positive log full change value or then you look at negative log log full change value and you also have a function called as summary so let's see what happens when you get this okay so this function called summary they just assume only uh, they assume a adjusted p value of 1% and then um, sorry uh, they are just they assume a adjusted p value of 10% and then they also trying to uh, put out the number of genes that are up regulated with respect to zero and up regulated with respect to uh, down regulated with respect to uh, zero but generally we would want to have a more stricter cut off where you know like uh, the log full change values are more than um, uh, you know 0.58 where in in the normal scale it would be around two or twice the amount of expression that, that you normally get with respect to the other group and everything so you can go with the lfc of 1 cut off or 0.58 cut off but zero uh, is like pretty very very low and then um, also you would want to uh, increase the i mean uh, i mean you know uh, the level of significance as well uh, you know you can put it put it down to 1% or 5% and take those only the idea is to take only those genes because these genes are like for with a better Uh, statement that they are these genes are actually 
um, upregulated or downregulated. And you can use those genes for downstream analysis. So a few other things that we also want to take a uh, look at us. So there are other ways to also see if this whatever you know workflow that you have gone through is actually correct or not. So uh, one way uh, to look at, like, for example, uh, you want to be sure that you've accounted for most of the variation that has been given in the data, and you want to see the most um, you know most significant gene. For example, um, if you want to see how the counts of the most significant gene again. You can do all that manipulation. So for now, first we are going to put the summary in the order of the, you know, uh, the respect of the adjust p value, and then let's look have a look at it. So when you put the sum, I mean, when you put the counts in respect to the adjusted p value. So when you look at this head, right, we can see the log pole change. Uh, you can see the direction of log pole change value as uh, as well. You look at the res, um, result object actually. So this result object will give us the direction of the um, uh, log full change value here. But because since I had specified it to be this particular condition versus control, everything is you know it will be in this particular format. And also to uh, for the DEC analysis, you can either do there are two um, tests, statistic tests that's available. You have a wall test, wall p value, wall test, and there's also likelihood, likelihood ratio test. So you can opt for any of these two. So the um, I think the the normal one, the already uh, like uh, the one that is commonly used is a wall test. And I've also performed the analysis with respect to Walters. So when you uh, arrange it with respect to the adjusted p-value, which is the lowest, you have like next to nothing, it's got the very highest p-value. So when you look at that, we have a gene that seems to be four times more, uh, uh, four times more higher in number in the gene counts with respect to the control. So it, for example, you want to look at this particular gene and you want to look at the control. I mean, you want to look at the gene counts of these particular genes. So there, in DEC, there's a function called this plot counts, where you give the data. You know, you initially we had created a data data object, right? Data DEC data object. So the idea is to give the DEC data object and the gene that you have uh, that you want to look at because we're just looking at this gene because it has the highest. I mean, it's got the highest significance per se, right? Because it's got a very low PHS value. So we're just taking the highest significant one and we're just looking at the, you know, uh, looking at the gene counts with respect to the design that we had given. So the entire analysis was done with respect to control versus a particular protocol. So we're just trying to see if indeed there is, uh, you know, this very highly significant gene is giving us a very high difference. And yes, like when you look at it, we can see that gene normally gene counts are around 2000 in case of the treated one, whereas in the control, they are in hundreds to 200s. So this again, like when you look at the very significant gene, if you have very distinct groups, I mean, you have distinct groups again in uh, the two conditions that you're comparing. Again, that is all kind of a validation that you have accounted for most of the variability and they've you actually come to you actually given a good design control and everything. And in case of um, so the best way to visualize in case of DSIC analysis is to go with um, volcano plot actually. So I'll just explain what the volcano plot is. This is the Yeah, so the volcano plot is that. So you have different colors, right, over here. So here in the volcano plot, I have kept a log. So there are two things here the log full change value and the adjusted p value. So I'm only looking at the genes that have very good statistical uh, p value. So we can actually look at genes here. They, uh, 
uh, okay here uh, so the log uh, okay they have not uh, there is no specific okay so here what they have done what i have done is i have colored the genes that have very 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 uh, you know high expression in the right side like and the down, a very highly upregulated genes that is having at least two times more, uh, um, uh, actually it will be four times more expression because it's in the log two scale. And then even the downstream, I mean, even these downregulated genes have very, very low expressed genes. So, but the another thing is that you would also want to have a very significant p-value, which I've not colored over here. So this helps us to look at you know, the distribution of genes, like how many genes we have, how many upregulated genes we have, and then it's like a very gross visualization that you could do, but uh, you can also undertake with respect to, so for example, we looked at a gene uh, which had the highest significance, right? So the highest significance gene, it is in minus 10, log 10. So the highest significant gene that we actually had looked at is this particular gene, which had around, um, I think two uh, or three, uh, log uh, it, it I don't know if I got the log for change, but this would be the highly significant gene. And then this gene, when we looked at the plot cons, we were able to see the, you know, the control having very less gene cons and the, and the virus of treatment having very, very high gene cons. So this Volcano plot is like one of the main uh, plots to show the distribution of it's only to represent, it's like a gross representation of the p-values as well as the log full chain values that you've got through analysis. So that is uh, one of the main things. So yeah, uh, these are the main, uh, you know, um, plots that you can look at. And if you want to actually use genes for downstream analysis, for example, if you want to look at uh, genes that enrichment analysis, or you want to look at uh, over representation analysis. Uh, so I'll just go through very, very basically, I'm just going to go through what these are. So over representation analysis, nothing but you, we have in RNA seq, I mean, even in other analysis, you would have gene sets, right? So these, these gene sets are nothing but genes that are actually involved in a particular pathway or a particular signaling pathway or a particular or a part of the pathway and all of that. So what we do is in case of over-representation analysis, we take the significant genes from the differential analysis that we just saw. So for example, for different, very significant genes, you would want to take only the genes that are less than 1%, that have only less than 5% of uh, adjusted p-value. And there are actually, uh, the log full change value was actually high above, it is above, um, you know, plus two or uh, it is less below minus two. We have certain, you can have any certain cutoff. If you have a lot of genes, you can actually have a very high cutoff or if you have very, very few genes, you would want to change the cutoff and everything. But uh, the best way to go would be to, you know, just uh, stick with the cutoff and, um, you know, uh, um, and just the p-value no matter what, uh, what the, the number of, you know, irrespective of the number of genes you're getting, because that would be like, even more adding to the, you know, the pathway that you get in the downstream. So we can do something called this over-representation analysis, where there's nothing but a Fisher's test you use to look at the genes in a significant list from the differential analysis and the gene set. So if the, like the, if the representation is very high, you have very low p-value again. Um, so you, using that, you can say that, Okay, this particular pathway is present in the uh, differential gene, which means these are the pathways that are perturbed or perturbed, or these are the pathways that have been altered by the particular, you know, particular treatment to the cell or by the particular pathology. And there's something called this gene enrichment where you look at the direction of the genes as well. For example, if all of them are you know, positively enriched, and then you see if it's negatively enriched, and then you say that okay, these gene sets are present in the um, tumors, or I mean, these genes are present in, for example, you do, like we did right now, you took the, uh, you know, you took an SN, uh, LN, SNL uh, treated uh, samples versus the control, right? For example, uh, you see that uh, a particular gene set is present in the 
uh, you know, the positively enriched or upregulated genes, you say that, okay, these gene, these gene cells are, are actually upregulated in this particular condition, whereas in the other condition is downregulated. So, but that direction is not given in the overrepresentation analysis. And there's something called as um, weighted WGCNA that is generally called, and there's a package for it. So what you do is you look at genes that are co-regulated, like uh, for example, they're uh, in they're you know upregulated or downregulated in the same way, or it could be in both directions. So there are different, you know, you have signed network to look at only upregulated. If it is an unsigned network, you can look at the genes that are upregulated as well as downregulated in a similar pattern. So and then you actually can uh, go further downstream and look at the pathways of these genes per se. Uh, so that uh, WGCNA is actually, it's like an analogous to this in uh, the differential expression analysis we just did. So differential expression analysis is like the, one of the basic things that you do with RNA-seq and there are several network analysis, for example, you can build a, uh, even uh, downstream of this particular uh, differential expression analysis, you can actually build a PPA network and look at hub genes. I mean, the genes that are highly, you know, uh, connected together, all those things. There, there are a lot of things that you could actually do. And D, I mean, the differential analysis is one of the basic things. And to understand the design and everything, you would have to do a lot of, like I'm stressing, you would have to do a lot of accelerated data analysis. That's a lot of stuff you have to do, look at it in a different way, account for all the variations, create a design, and then, uh, you know, get a bunch of um, uh, genes that are uh, very significantly up uh, enriched or, you know, like upregulated or downregulated, and use these genes to do a bunch of downstream analysis. So, and that will give you a bunch of pathways that are perturbed or, you know, that are, that are actually um, altered in some way because of this particular uh, pathological conditions. So, which is actually the end are, we would, there are, there are two things. So you would only look at the genes, you would want to only look at the genes, or you would want to look at the end pathways that are, uh, you know, um, that are altered. So depending upon your, uh, what you want to do, you could do what you, uh, I mean, uh, you could further go downstream or you could just stop at the differential expression analysis. So yeah, so this is, so this is what um, this is the end of my second tutorial. Uh, if you have any doubts, I think there are several doubts over here. Okay, I'll just start from the first. Okay, these cons are derived from files mapping to the reference. Yes, these are read cons. Like you get these read cons after mapping the reads that you uh, you know sequence. You map the reads to the reference. So you have several algorithm. I mean, you have several uh, reference mapping, um, uh, uh, you know, tools, for example, star, high set and everything. Tools itself will give you a read, will give you a list of, you know, a file of read cons and everything. If you specify, if we ask you to go, or you can map it and then use other tools to, you know, uh, calculate the read cons. Uh, these are actually derived from mapping to the reference. But there are also tools that do not necessarily need you to map to the entire reference. So these are called as pseudo aligners. So like I said, these are actually, they just use index files to, um, they have huge index files. And then they just use them to not, you don't necessarily have to map it, but they would just, uh, so called as pseudo aligners and they help you to just know the counts without mapping to the reference. So there are two ways that you can actually do uh, in case of uh, RNA seq. Uh, if there are many outliers, so how may you overcome the problem to minimize outliers? You'd have to discard the samples. Like I don't know where you're talking about. For example, if you're looking at in PCA and there are like you you would want to like generally you know you have some basic idea. You would actually have some basic idea about the material that you're given or the samples that you're given and you're looking at PCA and you have like really bad outliers, you have to discard them. You cannot use them in the DEC or any other analysis actually. So yeah, the main thing is you would, uh, even in case of WGCNA, there are 
there are uh, you know before you do the uh, whole analysis there is hierarchy clustering uh, so even in the tutorial they exp expect you to do hierarchical clustering and then try to see the uh, you plotted endogram and see if there are any big outliers and if there are outliers you don't include them in the analysis <clears throat> so the uh, plot dispersion estimates right one second i'll show you so okay um, the the blues are actually the gene counts. Uh, let me um, okay. I'll just redo the plots. So yeah. The NA in the NA mean the result table means that you know I told you right the, there are there might be few outliers that have been uh, plotted with the dark dots as well as you know it's been covered by a blue dot. Uh, one second, let it load. So those are actually outliers from the dispersion plot. So those outliers will be set to NA. Those were those genes are those genes won't be involved in the rest of the analysis, which means because they have the mean count and the dispersion that has been calculated does not fit the curve. Like for example, so these are the initial, uh, you know, the variability that is, I don't know why it's not coming. So yeah, I'll just go with this. Okay. So the, so in this plot, the mean normalized counts are plotted and then you calculate a dispersion value, right? This dispersion value is the maximum likelihood of. So there's, uh, uh, they have um, the maximum likelihood of the dispersion is calculated. So after that, what happens is they fit a curve. So the black dots are the original values, and after fitting the curve, they do something called as it is something called as shrinking, shrinkage. So the original counts are actually uh, the mean counts are actually adjusted to match the entire idea like the idea is to you you actually get the idea is to leverage the information from all the genes right so the mean counts are actually the counts are actually brought more closer to the curve so after being fit that is the final uh, that is that blue color is the final mean count of the normalized counts so after fitting the after fitting uh, or after shrinking the final counts you have those are the blue ones and the ones that are outliers where you know you have the black dot as well as the surrounding or the under, uh, surrounding blue ones are the outliers and those are discarded that's why they are set to any and the next question is that oh, please okay can we do division and also present data and literature? Uh, actually, WGCNA, you need a lot of background. It's 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 uh, pretty tricky, and I would need an entire class or entire hour to go from the basics to make sense of what's happening with the data and everything. So I don't think that's possible. Can we change the p value like instead of one? Uh, can we put something so that we can? Yeah. So the idea is that, for example, you have a result table, right? You can do whatever analysis that you want. So, um, so generally, how I proceed with this is that you have a research table, and then you can use. Um, so there are. So I use dplyr techniques. So I we generally use uh, we use a filter where uh, p adjusted value. Uh, so. But just as value is less than 0, 0.5 and you know log fc of okay. log i'm not sure exactly the okay log to full change you want the log uh, you know for example you want the absolute of log full change because you would want upregulated as well down regulated so absolute of log full change to be greater than one or whatever your cutoff is. Okay. 
is it Actually, it would be better if you convert all of them into <laughs> data frames. Easy to run the analysis and everything. So yeah, it, it depends upon your, you know. Um, okay, I'm sorry, it's a lot of data. So yeah, so you can, you the final set of gene counts can be what you want it to be. If you want very good, uh, you know, a statistic level you want um five percent or one percent you can choose it to be whatever percent you want but again you would also want to look at the number of genes you get in the final um after this particular cutoff and everything because you would not want very very less number of genes and you would not want to do the double stream processing so you would again have to look at that um, if for okay can okay if a sample size is low and having more outliers, um, if your sample size is low and you have more outliers, you would I would suggest you to have at least at the least three because even DEC call or would need three replicates, three biological replicates. So if you don't have one idea, would be to find studies, find other studies that has got. Uh, you know that has got data that is uh, those some papers like these days it's a norm if it is they say from a good lab or you know from a good institution it is a norm to put the data to make it available so you, you can go and look at geo there is that is a gene expression omnibus or sra you would find similar studies you can use those samples you can do quality checking then you would have to look at batch effect because bad, you, they've been uh, sequenced in different places, right? So you have to look at batch effect and uh, you'd want to correct for batch effect if the batch effect is present. So after that, you can use those samples in your analysis. So that is one way to go. But if you have less than three samples, there's no point in doing differential analysis. We have only one sample. No, uh, so instead there's something called this, uh, gene set pathway analysis for a single sample, but that is not, you know, the idea of the, you know, the basic idea of uh, doing a differential analysis and looking at all these variability is that you want to capture something, you know, something very, uh, you want to capture the most important variation between two different conditions. And if you want to capture that particular variation for, between two different conditions, it helps you to have as many data as you have. So there's no point in doing anything if you have one or two samples. So I'm talking about, and I've used DEC because that's like the lowest number of samples that you can use, like at least three different replicates. So uh, you cannot, is you cannot use with one sample actually so yeah in multiple conditions no for every single condition you would want at least three replicates for example uh, in the same just for example i'm just taking this metadata so in the metadata for example here i have just um, you know i have done this analysis with respect to protocol so for example i also want to learn the differential expression between the two time points given all this data so at each each of these conditions for this particular variable i have four replications right i have four biological replicates so i would need at least three or more in each of these conditions to actually study about it okay these are biological replicates here these like for example these are technical replicates so uh, like how to say okay wait a second yeah so you have uh, for example you have a sample you have that sample is nothing but a control and you 
uh, sequence it after two months. You take the same sample, do the sequencing again. Then two and three are actually technical replicates. But you have the sample, for example, there is 91.3. So you have a sample, which is actually a control. And then you, uh, you know, you, um, uh, wait, okay, they don't have, okay, they, the thing is they don't have a two month control. They don't have a biological replicate for two month control. These are all, tech, these two are technical uh, replicates, but in a different condition protocol study, you have um, another uh, technical replicate. So I would say 102 and 103 are technical replicates. But when you have this, uh, you know, across different tech, uh, you know, you have different, um, for example, in protocol, you have different time points at even different time points and across different samples they have taken uh, uh, you know, they have taken uh, different, uh, they have sequenced different uh, conditions, right? So these would be biological replicates. But 102, 103, and then 104, 105, these, these would form the technical replicates. 